Netflix is very concerned about kids these days. Snowflake, a young person who's considered overly emotional, <laughs> easily offended, fuck you guys, this is not okay, and dramatic. The new reality show Snowflake Mountain revolves around 10 so-called snowflakes between the ages of 19 and 26 who are told they're going to be on a reality show set at a luxury resort. The classic young person reality TV experience where you're shirtless on a beach, getting drunk, making out, and starting drama. In reality, the snowflakes were signed up for this show by their irritated parents and are faced with a wilderness survival challenge intended to teach them some lessons about real life. And look, I could use some lessons about real life, okay? I'm a Gen Z snowflake. I have pronouns. Like the rest of my generation, I spend my time scrolling through TikTok dissociating and calling things neoliberal. I'm not especially enthused by the prospect of employment. So I watched the show, and now I'm gonna tell you about all the ways that I was triggered. <laughs> We first meet the snowflakes as they're driven up a bumpy hill in the middle of nowhere, still optimistically holding on to the lie that they're headed to a luxury resort. But after they're abandoned on the side of the road, they begin to realize that this is not what they were promised. There's no roof anywhere, which is a concern. Out come Matt and Joel, two ex-military survivalists who explain to the snowflakes the actual premise of the show. You're here because your families have realized that you're not reaching your full potential. So everyone here sucks ass, basically. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. right off the bat, Snowflake Mountain feels like a conservative boomer fantasy. Two white man military vets confront a group of racially diverse young people with a harsh taste of reality. There are no safe spaces on Snowflake Mountain. There are no participation trophies in the rugged wilderness. As the hosts, Matt and Joel often serve as stand-ins for an imagined Snowflake-hating audience. From the moment they meet the contestants, they complain about them constantly. They're disrespectful, lazy, they're too sensitive, their skin's not thick enough, they're very entitled, they're completely useless. I hear whining. The snowflakes are so whiny. They whine every 30 fucking seconds. Their incessant condescension is balanced out by the fact that, at least at the beginning, the snowflakes are perfect stereotypes of lazy, entitled youth. You guys are gonna be standing on your own feet. This is not cool at all. Meaning you're gonna be accountable for yourselves. Excuse me, get what? Like we're introduced to Solomon, who's basically peak spoiled rich kid. Yo, I'm Solomon, your mom probably wants to date me. I'm a superstar, you wish you could be me, but you never could. You can never walk in these shoes. They're too expensive. And then there's Devin, a self-identified bitch. People are like, all you do is party. And I'm like, well, I'm a vegan too. I guess that's something I'm contributing to society. The whole cast is like the old man yells at cloud imagining of what Gen Z is like. According to the show, the unifying characteristic of these snowflakes is laziness. Supposedly, they all refuse to work. What they think is hard work, I can't even comprehend. They don't want to earn anything, they just want handouts. You know, that's the kind of stuff that really kind of pisses me off. In that sense, the show largely feels like a reaction to our shifting cultural attitudes towards work. We're in the midst of the Great Resignation, with millions of workers quitting their jobs. The Great Resignation forced companies to reevaluate how they retain talent. A record 4.4 million Americans quit their jobs. It seems like nobody wants to work these days. Snowflake Mountain might have you believe that this is a result of pure entitlement. Coddled Gen Z kids think they should get whatever they want without needing to work for it. Kids these days just want to be YouTubers. They literally want to be paid to watch trashy Netflix shows and then talk about them. Can you believe that shit? Look, yes, I do want to get whatever I want without needing to work for it. 
guilty as charged. During the Industrial Revolution, many intellectuals thought that advancements in technology would allow people to work less. Mechanization could meet people's needs with less human labor required, so we could all work much less and leisure much more. We could spend more time with the people we care about, we could pursue our hobbies, we could make art. In his book Bullshit Jobs, anthropologist David Graeber argues that the reason this decline of work hasn't happened isn't because the technology isn't there, it's because we're doing more and more unnecessary shit. Graeber focuses on jobs in which even the people who hold them feel that they're not doing anything of value. They do things like going through the motions of filing paperwork, managing people who don't need management, solving problems that shouldn't exist in the first place. Even among jobs that at least do something tangible, it can often be difficult to tell whether you're really making a positive contribution. Am I helping make people's lives better, or am I just helping sell them stuff they don't actually need? Why should so much of our lives be dedicated to endless profit generation? Why am I doing miserable work for minimum wage while the CEO of the company I'm working for is raking in billions? Workers are underpaid, they're burnt out, they feel disrespected in the workplace, or their work just doesn't feel meaningful. And in many cases, it's not meaningful. People aren't quitting their jobs because of some generational pandemic of laziness. They're quitting because their jobs suck. In Snowflake Mountain, this disillusionment with employment is passed off as a simple character flaw. Unemployed young people are just lazy and incompetent. I hate walking. I try to avoid it at all costs. But while the show is built around that stereotype, there's a noticeable disconnect between how the contestants behave day to day and how they behave in confessional interviews when they're talking directly to the camera. In confessionals, they are full-on all-out snowflakes. I'm not amused. I don't think I'm supposed to be here. I'm gonna sue Matt and Joel. They can think I'm an annoying little bitch, and that's fine because I think they're an annoying little bitch. But outside of that, when the producers aren't pressuring them to ham it up for the cameras, they honestly seem pretty normal. They go along with what Matt and Joel say. They don't even complain all that much, considering the fact that they were duped into participating. The first episode largely consists of them being pretty good sports, intercut with clearly played up for the camera snowflakey commentary. So nice to see you. Yeah, yeah. I'm still trying to feel like very positive. This is a really, really long walk, but it's gonna be worth it. Like, I know there's gonna be a villa. There's no villa. Matt and Joel blow up their suitcases. Ah! Oh, shit! This is for your own good. And then throughout the season, Matt and Joel repeatedly try to test the contestants' commitment to the show. We do question your commitment. The choices they make out there are gonna show us how bad they actually want to be here. Solomon really needs to work out if he's committed to being here. Why do you expect them to be committed? They didn't sign up for this. They're the ones behaving normally here. You're the ones who blew up their shit. We're blowing up their stuff for a couple of reasons. To teach them a lesson about adapting and overcoming, about setbacks in life, and simply because we want to. Most of the snowflakes do stay, though, in large part because after one contestant leaves early on, it's revealed that there's a $50,000 cash prize on the line to be awarded to the snowflake who grows the most or whatever. They're gonna be rich! Ah! That's a whole lot of money! They're gonna teach one of these entitled rich kids a lesson by giving them some money. Presumably another reason most of the contestants choose to stay is that even if the show isn't what they had hoped, they initially wanted to be on a reality show for the same reason as most reality show contestants these days, to build their personal brands and become influencers. Say what's up to my followers, guys. Everyone get in the selfies. The show portrays them all as lazy young people who don't care about their careers, but the show is literally a career opportunity. And I mean, as weird as the cash prize feels in a show premised on its contestants being spoiled, I do think they should be compensated for their time, and not just one of them either, they're all basically performers doing work for Netflix. Check out these lazy fucking snowflakes doing unpaid labor for us. The nail in the coffin for the snowflakes, though, is that most of them live with their parents. That's ultimately how they ended up on the show. They were sent there by their parents, and the implication is that they're taking advantage of their parents' generosity. That may be true of some of them, 
like Solomon? I think I d literally spoiled him and I try not to do it. He uses his personality on his mother. But it's not inherently shameful to live with your parents. In much of the world, it's culturally expected for children to live with their parents into their late 20s. And in the US, where it's generally not, many young people do so because of financial precarity, because of low wages and high rent. Even within the show's own storytelling, the implication that the snowflakes are just lazy and entitled doesn't really hold up. Like sure, some of them are absolutely spoiled rich kids, but then there are snowflakes like this guy Sonny. I would say like I'm definitely like a naturally like like lazy person. I've had like factory jobs. I did pizza delivery. I'll do what I have to do, but I'll, I'm not gonna do something if like I don't wanna do it. Like you can't be forced to be anything, you know? Kids these days know nothing of hard work with their coddled, cushy, factory jobs. I'm sick of all these spoiled snowflakes who work in factories. From what we're shown, the supposed problem with Sonny is that his work isn't where he derives meaning. His mom wants him to get a prestigious job as a doctor or a lawyer, but Sonny doesn't want work to be the basis of his identity. He works to get by. And apparently, that's snowflake shit. It's not enough just to work, you need to find meaning in it. Snowflake Mountain sets out to address the pervasive laziness of young people by exposing them to what it repeatedly refers to as real life. They can slip off a cliff, like this is real life. Real life, apparently, is when you spend weeks in the wilderness completing a series of survival challenges. Real life is summer camp. The contestants need to learn real world life skills, like climbing trees, punching through wooden boards, and going on scavenger hunts. In the real world, you have to skin your own deer. Oh! Your parents won't skin it for you. The parents were all complaining about things like that their children don't know how to use a dishwasher. And then the show is like, the solution is to go into the wilderness. There are no dishwashers in the wilderness. In the show, nature serves as an escape from the artificiality of modernity. Matt and Joel insist that these pampered young people need to be brought back in touch with their base humanity, which has been degraded by the luxuries of modern life. Mother Nature is the queen of tough love. Mother Nature's not gonna coddle you. The wilderness setting naturalizes the lessons that the show sets out to teach. The contestants are told that these aren't just lessons based on Matt and Joel's own values. They're natural. They're lessons from nature. All right, guys, wilderness school is in session. Huh? Predictably, the primary lessons that nature has to teach are about hard work. You can't be lazy in the wilderness or you'll starve and die. We often don't get second chances. Initially, the model of work that the show promotes seems to revolve around a rugged individualism often associated with wilderness. Matt and Joel invoke an image of masculine heroism. They talk about the importance of toughness and strength. Because the wilderness forces you to toughen up. The lessons get more more complex than that, though. The show provides a vision of what good, meaningful work could look like, and at times, I sort of start to see the appeal. Okay, let's get into the drama. This may not have been the reality show the snowflakes were expecting, but at least there's still petty drama. In the first episode, the contestants split off into two groups, a water group and a forest group, with two separate challenges in order to find food rations. The forest group finds components to make s'mores. Marshmallow! Period. But even though they're supposed to be shared by everyone, Solomon convinces the group to keep those top tier snacks from the water groups so that they can have more for themselves. Now I just look like I got a big one. Sonny, what do you think would be good to eat? I mean, I just wish that we got, you know, some more like dessert items. Like marshmallows or something, right? Yeah. Matt and Joel watched this all go down via spy cam, an iPad attached to the inside of an equipment case. Check out this little setup, man. Oh, nice. They keep acting like they're watching a covert surveillance feed that the contestants don't know about. For them to not have a clue that we're watching them remotely. <laughs> I love it. I mean, we're getting intel on what's what's really going on. Yeah. But the footage is very clearly shot by camera people and edited with multiple camera angles. Anyway, this conflict is where the real lessons of the show start to shine through. Because in a way, the deception is a perfect act of individualism. It's a snowflake eats snowflake world. It's every snowflake for snow self. But Matt and Joel do not approve. The knife in the back, 
right from the start. They decide to give the forest group some time to see if they'll come clean on their own. And at first, Solomon keeps being like, we need to agree to keep this a secret, guys. We can't tell the others. And then an episode later, he just tells Devin because he has a crush on her, I guess. I got you a chocolate bar, vegan, of course. You gotta keep this a secret. She tells the rest of the water group and it leads to a big confrontation. There's a lot of insecure people in this camp. There's a lot of fake people. Fake. Really fake people. And broke. Solomon's out for fucking blood. I brought the beauty when you brought the ugly. Again, this conflict started because Solomon wanted extra s'mores. The king that I am stands alone and they're in an army full of losers. Matt and Joel's lessons in response to this drama are about teamwork. The group needs to listen to each other and resolve their conflicts. We saw some pretty shocking attitudes and a, a lack of respect for each other. Matt and Joel don't want the snowflakes to be in competition. Instead, they're asked to cooperate with each other, to share their resources, and to come together as a community. The framing of the conflict suggests that good work is done not in service of yourself as an individual, but in service of the collective. Despite its snowflake bashing premise, once you get past the first episode, the show is often surprisingly sensitive and compassionate. Like, Devin being a V is initially set up in the show as a joke. It's her one personality trait. It's annoying snowflake behavior. Because I'm vegan. But then when they get to the deer skinning challenge and Devin opts out, everyone's perfectly respectful. Yeah, her attitude was good. If she needs to leave, that's fine by me. Or when introducing the challenges, Matt and Joel often talk about them as mind over matter. The snowflakes can do anything if they just try hard enough. This is not a physical task, it's a mental task. This is all about mind over matter. But then one snowflake, Deandra, fails to climb a tree and they're just proud of her for trying. I wouldn't have been any more proud of her if she would have rung the bell. Smells like a participation trophy to me. But no, Matt and Joel teach the snowflakes to accept each other's limitations, to help where you can, but not to punish others when they don't succeed. From each according to their ability to each according to their need. Matt and Joel are my Marxist daddies. Ultimately though, I think the primary lesson of the wilderness setting is to demonstrate to the snowflakes that hard work can be satisfying. In the wilderness, the value of work is clear. You skin a deer to eat the deer. You cut down a tree for firewood to start a fire to cook the deer. The relationship between your labor and human satisfaction is clear. You and your wilderness comrades directly receive the benefits of your work. The snowflakes learn to take satisfaction Satisfaction and a job well done because the value of that job is made immediately accessible to them. It's hard work, ah! but I mean, just watching that tree fall made it all worth it. But if this is meant to teach them about the value of hard work in the real world, I mean, the real world just isn't like that. In the real world, I pick up my dino-shaped veggie chicken nuggets from Whole Foods and I don't see the labor that went into producing them. The farmers and factory workers essential to the production process don't see my soy boy satisfaction when I eat the nuggets. And those workers aren't compensated for the value of my satisfaction. Much of the money I pay goes not towards them, but towards profits that they don't get to see. In many of the jobs that these snowflakes might be looking at, the value of their work it's even more obscure. When I grow up, I want to be a social media manager for Slushy Cup. I work in, um, supermarket playlist curation. I make the world a better place by making sure no one brings outside food and drink into the movie theater. The wilderness provides the snowflakes with an experience of unalienated labor. They work together to provide for themselves. Their obligations towards each other are tangible. The social relationships underlying their labor are clear. Their work feels meaningful. There's no corporation extracting profit from the skinning of the deer. Or well, I mean Netflix? Snowflake Mountain was filmed in the English Lake District, with its main base set up at Graithwaite, which advertises itself in its marketing material as a private estate with luxury holiday cottages and magnificent lake or woodland views across the English Lake District. Mother Nature's not gonna coddle you. An idyllic setting for memorable holidays. If it's cold, that means hypothermia, and that means Likelihood of death. Tranquil glamping on the shores of Lake Windermere. Spiders crawling around the inside of your shelter, bugs everywhere. It, it, it can be 
Oh, scary. Yeah. This rugged wilderness survival challenge is occurring at a private estate marketed as a bourgeois luxury vacation spot. The wilderness that the show mythologizes isn't an escape from the artificiality of modernity. It's constructed. Environmental historian William Cronin makes a similar point in his 1995 article, The Trouble with Wilderness. He explains that the idea of a pristine wilderness that stands outside of human society is a relatively recent cultural invention. According to Cronin, in the American imagination, understandings of wilderness are tied to the myth of the frontier, a romanticized narrative of colonization. As historian Frederick Jackson Turner described the process, Easterners and European immigrants, in moving to the wild lands of the frontier, shed the trappings of civilization and thereby gained an energy, an independence, and a creativity that were the sources of American democracy democracy and national character. Seen this way, wilderness became a place of religious redemption and national renewal, the quintessential location for experiencing what it meant to be an American. This was always a myth. The land was inhabited, and the native people who lived there were violently removed and displaced. The wilderness didn't teach its values to the frontiersmen. Those values were imbued upon it, rooted in narratives of expansion and conquest. And as colonization and industrialization progressed, spaces designated as wilderness were defined and maintained by people. The wilderness doesn't allow us a return to some older, simpler world. It's a modern invention on which our own cultural values and desires are placed. Snowflake Mountain makes it especially clear that its wilderness is crafted. It's supposedly a rugged survival experience, but it's an image of nature clearly staged for entertainment. Like the tree the snowflakes climb has climbing wall holds on it as a reward for climbing the tree, they're given a hot tub? Welcome to the untouched wilderness. The show's fantasy of pre-capitalist, unalienated labor isn't actually available to us. And I mean, I don't especially want it to be. I'm personally not interested in hunting and gathering. I don't want to work motivated by a raw fear for survival. I like my soy boy veggie products with extra estrogen, please. For Cronin, there are stakes to mythologizing wilderness. In imagining that our unalienated selves belong to nature, we fail to take responsibility for the world as it is. We live in an urban industrial civilization, but too often pretend to ourselves that our real home is in the wilderness. We work our nine to five jobs, we drive our cars, we benefit from the intricate and all too invisible networks with which society shelters us, all the while pretending that these things are not an essential part of who we are. By imagining that our true home is in the wilderness, we forgive ourselves for for the homes we actually inhabit. In turning to the wilderness, Snowflake Mountain fails to recognize the conditions of our actual lives. The show ends on a feel-good note. The snowflakes successfully climb a mountain, Matt and Joel reveal that they didn't actually blow up the suitcases, and the cash prize goes to Deandra who uses it to start her own beauty business. Then we're given some updates on where the rest of the cast is now. This is supposed to be where we see how much they've grown with the help of the show. I am an independent man now, so I don't need to live with these people anymore. I now live in an apartment attached to the house. Most of them are working in some capacity, but many of them still don't have jobs exactly. Several are trying to start their own businesses. Sonny started a podcast. He's no longer a snowflake working in a factory. Now he has a real job podcasting. The Snowflake's aversion to wage labor hasn't changed. They're still avoiding employment through their various entrepreneurial pursuits. Now though, the show presents them through individualist success narratives. They're conquering entrepreneurs. In its best moments, Snowflake Mountain promotes values of community and solidarity. Let's not leave those in the wilderness. The actual problems were never with the Snowflakes. They're with work. In the supposed real world of Snowflake Mountain, working for the collective good might mean grueling labor for survival. 
but in the real real world, it means ensuring people's needs are met without the grueling labor needed. It means building a world where we can work less. And for the work that needs to get done, it means improving working conditions and compensation so that people want to do it. Instead of escaping into the wilderness, let's learn to look out for each other in the world we already have. Wow, look at me. I climbed a mountain and I'm still a lazy snowflake. Inspiring. If you enjoyed this, you might also enjoy my video about the dating show F-Boy Island. Uh, I'm just gonna make a video about every reality show where the title is like, insult type of place. And also support me on Patreon and all that. Uh, okay, bye.